Thank you for having me. Uh, today, I present a little bit of the Spectra box, which started out as a lit artifact of funded uh, experiment and also was done in collaboration with Pro Future uh, our Comet Center, uh, located at JQU, as well as inspired by our research collaborator, Engel. So let me jump right in. So here you see uh, on the right hand side, a factory box, a kind of uh, bird's eye view. What we have really is we took Lego because they're really simple to use. And we kind of tried to build a factory floor, uh, kind of in a very small scale, very simple. Um, and what we have here, what you see on, uh, really see here, so what I will show a video a little bit later on, is that we have uh, pallets of paper that get moved around to the shop floor. So we have on the top and on the bottom two kind of plotters where you can do simple drawings. We have in the middle two turntables that can move uh, these pallets around. And we have uh, an input station, output station where we can feed in new pallets with empty paper and then uh, receive uh, the drawings uh, on the output station. And the idea uh, was that, well, on the one hand, we use Lego, which is kind of more of a toy, but it's kind of excellent for rapid prototyping because it's cheap and it's fast and well understood. But at the same time, we use in industry grade software and communication protocols. So kind of to make it more realistic, the whole thing. And the idea was we wanted to demonstrate the adaptability on the shop floor and how to achieve it. And so we have different types of adaptabilities. For example, we can think of when we want to change the production of changing the shop floor layout. So in this case, we can move around the plotters to different locations. We can move input station around. We could add more of these turntables. So we have some flexibility in how those kind of production modules are uh, arranged. Uh, and uh, another step then would be to adapt the production process. So we want uh, not to build something where this, it, the same thing is produced over and over again, but we wanted to get towards where you have lot size one, that means each product is compare, uh, potentially different from the next product and still use uh, this flexibly on this kind of production cell. And third, we wanted to be able to also play around with the flexibility and adaptability of the production schedule. So we didn't want to say, okay, you have to use machine one first, and then two, and then three, and then you are done. But kind of just describe what we want to do in terms of let's print the uh, uh, folding instruction for a small box, and then do the drawing instruction for a large box. And then you draw in a different color when you have to fold backwards, and a different color when you have to fold towards yourself. And then depending on how the shop floor is laid out and what are the abilities of these machines, uh, the system decides itself which machine will do what and when. And uh, these, all these kind of these aspects are important in industry today because more and more we are no longer producing mass, uh, mass products, but we want to go towards individual customization. We want to be able to rapidly switch uh, to different uh, product demand, to different customer desires, and do this uh, rearranging with as quickly as possible and also as correctly as possible. So we need to understand how this can be done and do this with little error. And the focus here um, of this prototype is software enabled flexibility, but not necessarily hardware precision, because after all, that is Lego. Before I want to uh, show a little demo, I will just go a little, few technical details. So we have some variety in these different machines. So we have these Lego EV3 Mindstorms. These are the small uh, um, uh, boxes that you can buy. Uh, and on this runs Fortier Forte, which with an industrial sta uh, standard, communicating also via OPCOA, which is an industrial standard. But to give a little bit more variety, we also have uh, brick pies, which run uh, on, the, on the turntables. Uh, that also uh, use a different programming language, also use the same coding, uh, interaction standard OPCOA, but provided by a different uh, system. And also we have another uh, system, a uh, Raspberry Pi base that runs the whole control of the various machines, how they should coordinate. So we, all these, as you see, are different machines that have to interact with each other. And this is why we also have some editors that you see here on the right-hand side, which are there to control a little bit the uh, how things are wired up, but also to control the, the actual shop floor. And uh, so to give you a little bit idea how the whole thing looks like, I will uh, show you a small uh, uh, video. 
uh, where you can see the individual modules. Each module is actually its own a little PC. It's not very powerful, but it's powerful enough to do the production uh, process. And you see uh, all this, uh, we have uh, various sensors on this machine. So we have light, uh, so consistent sensors, we have sensors, uh, we have uh, then individual engines that kind of then control the movements of the plotters. And most of this is driven by events. So we get, uh, the system sees, oh, okay, there's a new pallet available. Okay, let's see which machines are available for the next topic. And so we see, okay, what is available on the shop floor and what state is that system. And whenever we know, okay, now we have reduced the first step, what is the next step? Okay, giving it to another machine. So we know which uh, um, transport systems we need. We can, they can move around the pallet, move it to the next uh, station. Um, and there we do the next production step. So in this example here, you see just a very simple demo of just drawing a line because these are not the quickest machines. But the challenge is now, uh, how do you do these individual machines have to coordinate today can flexibly be rearranged um, in a different way? And how can we produce different drawings there, a different order of these drawings, uh, kind of adapt to these things? And um, for, um, I go to this other demonstration. So here we produce the first uh, uh, product. Uh, I will uh, show, we'll briefly talk about what are these elements that now enable flexibility. So on the uh, right hand side here, you see uh, part of the architecture of the vector in the box. But this, I mean, what are the various um, elements, the small components and how they are linked up and talk to each other. So we have some kind of uh, order planning. We have some transport system coordination going on. We have some representatives of a turntable. We have some input station uh, representatives and the actual software that then runs on these individual machines. And by having a, a correct or a useful uh, uh, architectural style, this describes how these elements should be wired up, how they should be connected so that they uh, are easy to change. And therefore you have to have certain rules and these rules are typically described in a particular architectural style. Another element are using events. So instead of one component asking another component to do something and waiting for the result, we just send an event, um, send a message, and then we wait for some later time to receive back the result. And also this makes it more decoupled, it does easier to change on the fly. Another element are explicit interfaces. That means each of these components says, I am able to do this kind of service, but not only saying I can do this, but also what would I require in order to do my service? So we can immediately know when we want to add a new element into our shop floor, not only what it can provide, but also what are the other services it would need in order to be able to communicate with them. Uh, which brings us to the next point, which is exposing connections. So we can just uh, ask each element on the shop floor, how are you connected to other components? So we can tell the coordinator, who are you connected with? And then we can understand how the individual elements are uh, wired up without knowing this upfront and therefore making, the, making this managing of connections available. So we can tell the uh, turntable, please disconnect you from this place and reconnect to another spot. And ultimately we do monitoring of interactions. So we can know uh, once who is wired, so who is connected to whom, and then how are the uh, interactions going on? And we can do this on the actual um, uh, high level, but also on the very low level detailed components that run within each of the system. So perhaps give you a brief um, idea here. Uh, we uh, continue with the next uh, process here. And now we're gonna change something. What we do is uh, while we are starting our production, we now remove one of those plotters. Um, the control system will understand, oh, okay, this plot is no longer there, so it can't be used. We also disconnect an output station, so for the moment, we can't actually export anything from the shop floor. But as the, the system progresses on, we can relocate, we put the machine in a different spot, we can boot up the software running on that machine. The machine will tell, okay, hi, hello, I'm here. I can do this functionality. And now we know, okay, we can use this output station. But what we also can do then is, or what we also need to do is that now this turntable that you see on the left-hand side needs to know that there's no longer an output station on its uh, uh, left-hand side, but only on its uh, closer side to us. So we have to rewire this and tell it now, please, if you coordinate pallet handover, 
now you need to talk somewhere else. And in this case, after uh, we have rewired everything, and we know that this wiring was successful because we can only wire up what matches. So the interfaces must match. So the turntable says, I need somebody who can do a handshake with me. And the output station is one of those um, components. There we can therefore wire them up. And then the um, turntable will get the, the last command saying, please from plot uh, three, please I'll put this uh, to the output station. And uh, we didn't have to program anything in our process, in our order, that now where this should be delivered to. And this was a, a small example of how we can change during the production, the layout of uh, the process, uh, of the uh, production cell. Uh, what we also uh, uh, investigated was uh, distributed tracing, which is about establishing causality. So what goes on and why did something happen on the shop floor? Why did this turntable now turn there? And uh, we can do this by uh, um, monitoring the interactions. So we put in correlation information in every event that goes on within a machine and across. And so we, what you see here on the right-hand side is uh, a kind of a trace, which means uh, each component, each element that is participating in, for example, transporting one order from machine A to machine B, will kind of pop up and say, okay, I did this and we know at what particular time this happened. So you see the small kind of lines uh, in the middle that says when something happened. And by this, we can understand, okay, how long did something take and why did something happen? So we can analyze performance bottlenecks. We can do root cause analysis with that information. And for small, uh, just inter machine across the network communication, this looks rather simple. But if we have a look at something where we take a whole order, and how it goes through the whole shop floor with all individual tiny components within each of my machines, this gets obviously much more complex and we can do much more refined analysis here. And so this trace, what you see on this uh, figure now is actually just a third of the overall trace that you would see that a production of one such uh, drawing uh, requires. Lastly, I would like to briefly touch the topic of teaching as uh, the lead artifact call, this artifact was also meant to enable teaching and support us. Uh, in this case, with soft intensive systems engineering, uh, where we can now bring students together that learn about event based communication. So, rather, how to send messages and wait for responses later on, but doing something in the meantime. To this end, we use other extra centric programming. We, uh, we can teach about how to deal with lost, delayed, or out of order messages. Uh, what are the software architectures? So, the principles that uh, these components should be connected to each other. Well, we can teach about model-driven design, so how to model certain aspects of the system first before implementing it, and also uh, teach about uh, realistic uh, actual use modern uh, communication protocols in cyber-physical production systems such as OPC Wave. And here you see some extensions that we're already uh, building on, which is uh, two collaborative robots that kind of feed in uh, to the whole uh, whole system where you can see small kind of trace where we had some folding done already where these drawings get folded up and then transported on and we use the same mecha mechanism, same soft abstractions there. And the nice thing is students get to try out the code and actual hardware to see something moving around. And the, so, and the main aspect here is that it's sufficiently complex to convey these ideas and principles, but it's still simple enough that you don't get lost in the details because there's some limitations, how many sensors, how many actors you can use. And this helps to reduce the complexity, but still uh, get a valuable teaching experience across. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. I want to bring your last attention to all the people involved in this uh, uh, project, uh, which is what a collaboration as I mentioned also with for the future. Um, and also I'd like to point your attention to the code that is available under an LGBL license when you follow the link or to take a picture of the QR code. Thank you.